Hey there crew, Brandon here. Welcome to another increasingly poorly named Masks Monday, the show that raises your RPG from zeros to heroes. I'm Brandon, and today we're going to be talking about the two investigative moves from Masks A New Generation, Assess a Situation and Pierce the Mask. Now I put these two moves together because they're largely about gathering data. They're where your character is interacting with the world in a way that is consuming information. They're both a little bit weirder than the other moves because of that. They have some very specific quirks that make it a little harder to hit that trigger, but in this video I'll be trying to give some ways to make sure that you're able to do that. Additionally, I'll go through the different options and give some advice on what the GM should be doing in order to make sure that the players get the best result that they can possibly get out of it. From the GM side of things, these moves have a lot of overlap, so I'm going to tackle some of that towards the end of this video, but let's go ahead and just dive right in to assess the situation. When you assess the situation, roll plus superior. On a 10 plus, ask 2. On a 7 to 9, ask 1. Take plus 1 while acting on the answers. The options are, what here can I use to blank? What here is the biggest threat? What here is in the greatest danger? Who here, who here is most vulnerable to me? And how could we best end this quickly? As always with these moves, let's start with the trigger. For this one, it's when you assess the situation. Now implied in this is that the situation is kind of tense or dangerous or complicated. If you're just kind of looking to see who to sit next to at lunch. Actually, no, yeah, wait, that's a great reason to assess the situation. That totally works. If you're just trying to ask some information about what is in a scene, like, hey, is there a chair? Then you can just ask the GM. That's not assessing. Assessing is when your character is really taking a look at things and trying to understand fundamentally what's going on and what are the possible risks and problems that they might face. Base. This can be a little bit hard to trigger in a mechanical way, so I'm going to come back to that later. It's the same problem as Pierce the Mask. In any case, you're asking questions of the GM and the GM is telling you the truthful answer to them. These questions cover a really wide range of things, even though it can kind of seem like you're sort of limited, but that limitation lets you really hone in on the things that are important for a teenage superhero. The question that has the most complication to it is what here can I use to blank? Uh, that could really be anything. It could be what can I use to shut down Tony Stark's armor and the answer and the GM basically just tells you the correct honest answer to what it is. And sometimes that answer can be no. What here can I use to cage the Hulk? Sorry bro, there's nothing. There's nothing that you can use here. Then the players know that they shouldn't try to cage the Hulk. It's not going to happen. Who here is the greatest threat and who is in the greatest danger? are two questions that are kind of like connected to each other. The first is what is the scariest thing around? What is the thing that is most likely to cause danger soonest? What thing is the most likely to be hard to stop if it starts creating danger? And the other one is the one that is who is most in need of defending essentially? Like who is in this situation that's in way over their head? For those, pay attention to what makes sense in the narrative. If who is the greatest threat is your ally because they're the strongest person there, that doesn't really make sense unless they are like teetering on a villain line themselves. They're not a threat, they're just the biggest, beefiest hitter. Likewise, if the villain is in like an enormous mechanized suit that's crushing the city, but they themselves are not a big threat, they're not in the greatest danger. They're in a giant mechanized suit. Probably the civilians that are around are the biggest danger. Who here is most vulnerable to me is not just the polar opposite of what the biggest threat is. This is asking specifically for you who is most vulnerable. This might have to do with your specific power set. If you are sets leaves on power lass and you're up against leaves dude, good news, you've got the upper hand. But it might also have to do with being emotionally vulnerable to you because you have some kind of an edge on them. Maybe they love you and that is a really good reason that they'd be extremely emotionally vulnerable. I love this because it's kind of like, hey, I'm ready for this encounter to end, how can we make that happen? And that's a bad interpretation of it, and that's definitely not how you should be using it, but it does tell you the quickest way to wrap things up, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes a fight starts to drag on and you're like, no, hold on, we gotta deal with this quickly. And there's no reason that you can't use it in that kind of meta way. But additionally, it should speak to trying to shut down the problems and move past the situation so that it can be resolved in some way of being safer. So maybe the best way to resolve this quickly is by punching out the villain. Maybe it's by running. Maybe it's by making amends and talking to somebody. The amount of times that this question gets asked and the correct answer is like, hey, this villain wants someone to listen to them and take them seriously for once in their life? That's 
enormous and that's such a wonderful place for masks to live because we have all of the cool tools to have those social interactions in a way that's meaningful. So why not jump into them and do them? The last thing that I want to address other than the miscondition, which I'm going to address for both moves at the same time, is your 10 plus. Now, if you get a 10 plus on this move, you get a plus one ongoing to moves made in relation to the answers you got. So if you asked a question about what can we use to bind this person, and then you try to bind this person, you've got a plus one on it. That plus one sticks around as long as the situation hasn't changed. If the situation changes in a dramatic way, you'll need to make another assess the situation to get a plus one going. Additionally, it isn't every role in this situation. It is specifically the ones that relate to this. Who here is most vulnerable to me? You can have a plus one while you're dealing with that person. But if you decide to instead attack their friend, then you don't have that plus one because you aren't doing the thing that you asked about. Basically, this is a great way to boost your move up and get a little bit of a better situation. Remember also that the highest you can add to a roll ever, no matter what, no exceptions, is plus four. So if you are making this roll and you have a plus three plus another situational bonus and you get a plus one to assess the situation, then you just get a plus four. It doesn't grow to a plus five, which would make it literally impossible to fail, which is why that rule is in place. Let's go ahead and hit Pierce the Mask. This is another information gathering move, but it's a more social one. It has a specific social target. So let's dive into that one. First, the text. When you pierce someone's mask to see the person beneath, roll plus mundane. On a 10 plus, ask three. On a seven to nine, ask one. What do you intend to do? How could I get your character to blank? How could I gain influence over you? What are you really planning? And what do you want me to do? First things first, the trigger. It is not referring to someone literally wearing a mask, although oftentimes you will be. Just because someone doesn't have a mask on doesn't mean that they don't have uh, emotional or social walls that are blocking you off from understanding what they're really thinking. It's much more about that, but it also requires a level of observation and interaction with the person. If you're watching somebody, watching their body language, watching how they react to things, that can be plenty. If you're in a conversation with somebody, it's even easier to justify that you've hit the move. When you're trying to like understand what someone is doing and why someone is acting the way they are, this move is the one that you want to go for. The results are pretty basic other than the questions themselves, so I'm going to really focus in on those. The question, what are you really planning, has to do with longer term plans, not just what they're doing right now. The answer is probably not, my plan is to go have coffee at Duncan. It probably has bigger ideas and bigger thoughts. It's more or less what is your overarching goal in this interaction and in further ones. Contrast that with what are you going to do. That is the immediate thing. That is a great way to figure out, hey, this person is going to betray me like right now. If you want to know if someone is lying to you, this isn't a necessarily a direct way to get that information, but it's a pretty good start. Alternately, if you want someone to tell you the truth, you could ask the question, how could I get your character to tell me the truth? And then you'll have to just do what is necessary to do it. This question probably deserves a little bit more of a glance. Most of the time, the player should be able to tell you a response. On the other hand, there are probably things that your character would not do or an NPC would not do. I think that it's best to give an answer as often as possible, but sometimes it can be nothing. I just don't like that as a GM. I've been using the player for this answer. The main reason I'm doing that is because the GM is a player at the table. So even if they are controlling an NPC, you're still asking the player, not the character. So you're working out what is being understood, not necessarily directly saying to the person, what do I have to do for you to tell me the truth? You can. It can be a nice way to do the scene, but you are understanding a truth that is possibly deeper than their understanding of the truth in the situation. That's another reason that it has to be honest, but I'm going to come back to that in the GM section at the end of this. What do you want me to do is another of the questions. It's a really, really good one. It's a really interesting one because it really sets up the next situation. So if you ask what they want you to do and you do it, then you're potentially setting things up and like making a deal with them and that's really cool. But also, what do you want me to do can be a phenomenal opportunity for them to shift your labels. I want you to stop hurting people and be a hero. That's danger down, savior up. And that's phenomenal. It's that move snowball that just is so cool in this game. 
lastly, how could I get influence over you? So that is the direct mechanical program of influence. And if you do the thing that they tell you to do, they have to give you influence because they told you that's how they get influence over you. Now, if the situation is like really twisted and confused and messed up and stuff like that, maybe they don't. But like, again, as someone who's playing within the rules, it's more fun if you do it. If you ask how to get influence, they can't lie to you or they're cheating at the game. I know that's a little harsh, but if you're not following the rules, you're cheating. Especially when it's a thing that the player has asked for and made a s actual selection of a choice. They could have gotten other information, but they chose this one. So you have to give them influence. If they already have influence over you, uh, I think you can just tell them you already have influence over me. And that is perfectly good. If it's player to player, that's a little unsatisfying. If it's NPC to player, it's a little bit more satisfying. While we're talking about influence and this move, don't forget that when you use a move on somebody that you have influence over, you get a plus one. Because they care about you, because they care about what you think, they are a little more on edge, they're a little bit more unprepared, they're a little bit more vulnerable toward you. Hey, just like Assess the Situation says. But this is one where that can happen a lot because Pierce the Mask is really, really common player to player. And that's a lot of times when you'll have influence over people. The chances of you having influence right off the bat on the villain that you're fighting is pretty low, although this is a great way to get influence on that villain and then get that plus one all over the place. From here I want to talk about best practices for delivering the truth in PBTA games. Now this is a little bit broader than masks, but it definitely applies to masks. Literally in a game I was in a couple days ago, the GM asked me, how much do I need to tell the players? And that's kind of a complicated question. The truth is, you tell the players the answer to the question. If they ask, what are you really planning? You have to tell them what you're really planning. You don't need to tell everything you're planning, but like, if the player is talking with Magneto and saying, uh, what are you really planning? Then Magneto doesn't get to say, oh, I'm just trying to, you know, kind of uplift mutants in a general sort of way. They should say, oh, I am setting up an enormous situation that will make humans look bad and mutants look good. And then the player gets to make a judgment based on that. Masks isn't a game that investigation is the fun part. Masks is a game that you get the information and you do stuff with that information. The longer you spend trying to work out investigative things, the slower your game will go and the less satisfying it will be for you and for the players. Give them the information because that information snowballs into the next thing. Now that you know that Magneto is doing this, you have to decide, are you going to stand with your mutant people or are you going to stop this? And that's when things get complicated and hard and cool and fun. The other question, the other question that these two moves often ask is on a six minus, what happens? You don't get to ask questions. Isn't a GM move. Use a GM move. You have so many GM moves. Don't forget about them. You can use them to say, hey, you're looking around and you notice X, Y, or Z thing. I'm particularly fond I'm particularly fond of turn the move against them, where you say, ah, ask me a question. And then you give them the worst case scenario. What's the biggest threat here? Oh, you didn't notice. That's the Herald of Galactus, isn't it? And then things have snowballed and moved forward, and you've played fairly. You can also say, as you're peering through the trees, you're hit in the back of the head with a chair. That's perfectly fine also. Just don't do nothing. Last thing I want to hit is how do we trigger these moves? They're a little bit weirder than the other ones. Remember, to do it, you have to do it. But these are the ones that it's really tempting to just say, um, I assess the situation. If the player does that, or if you feel like you're going to do that, instead try to look at how you can describe it. Describe your character moving through the trees and watching the compound and trying to, like, get a good view of what's going on. Describe your character in the conversation, peering at the person, and, like, weighing out what their thoughts are. And if a player asks to do the move, just let them do the move. Maybe ask them what the panel looks like, because that will help make your game a little bit better. But this is pretty much, these are the two moves that to do it, you do it, but doing it is boring looking. So just do the thing, move on, and get to the questions, because that's where you're going to get to the fun part of the game. You can only hear, I look direct, you can only hear, I look deeply into their eyes, so many times before it's like, oh, this 
is the same as saying I pierced the mask. And then you haven't gained anything. So don't belabor the point with it on your players. Just play the game. There are additionally some playbooks that get some additional questions on this. Those can be super cool, So, but it's pretty much up to the player to remember that they have those questions. It's not your job as the GM. It's your job as the player to be looking at your moves. The GM can't possibly juggle everybody's playbook moves all the time, especially when they're more complicated ones like that. So now you're able to gather all of this information in your masks game. This lets you cut through a lot of the kind of slow down and investigation and we can't figure out what's going on. Hit these moves as soon as they come up. They're well worth it. They move fast and they change the fiction in ways that are really, really important. And players, GMs, everybody, just tell the truth. There's no reason for secrets at your masks table. If they ask, what do you want me to do? Tell them the wonderful vision that you have of them. If they ask, what's the biggest threat? Tell them about your cool super weapon that you've been waiting all session to tell them about. Now is your chance to describe it. It's going to be awesome. And it's going to be awesome and the players deserve to see it. But that is all for this week. I'm sorry that these videos have been coming out later than Monday. I'm trying to get back onto a schedule with it, but things have been tough as I've been looking for a job in my regular life. I've got some really big, exciting, wonderful life changes happening, and that unfortunately takes up a lot of the time that I have for this. Thank you so much for bearing with me. I appreciate it so much. If you would like to support these videos and other RPG work I do, consider checking me out at patreon.com slash Gambetta. This show couldn't happen without the support of my patrons, and I just appreciate you all so much. Big thanks this week to new contributor Krom, and to dear existing friends, Jack Beckwith, Shannon, Stenter Danielson, Evan Nyquist, Eli Seitz, Devin Preston, Claire West, Ananda Ray, and Justin Hunter. This week there's going to be a bonus Spider Day video, which is an event being put on by Critical Bits. Spider Day is a big, cool, silly superhero crossover event. Check it out on the Critical Bits cast, or go to spiderday.com to learn a little bit more. I participated in it, and it's giving some money to a really great charitable organization. So please check it out as well. Also, next Monday, hopefully, I'll be back with two more basic moves. This time, comfort or support, and provoke somebody. The two moves used to change people's emotional states. I don't know if Brendan did this on purpose, but it's making it really easy for me to make these videos in a themed way, so thanks, Magpie! If you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe, and if you want to get notifications, ring that bell. Until next time, keep on being a force for good in a world that hates and fears you. Bye, folks.